Okay, hello everyone. Thanks for joining us. My name is Robert. We're running a couple minutes behind schedule, so let's go ahead and get underway. And I uh, will introduce Hannah. And Hannah, take it away. Thank you so much, Robert, um, for organising this. It's such a pleasure to be here to be speaking to you all. I know there's quite a lot of us, so um, thank you so much for for joining wherever you are in the world. And it's been so lovely to read in the chat box about sort of where you're dialing in from, so keep that coming. So uh, my name's Hannah Rose, it's lovely to meet you all, or e-meet you. I'm based at the University of Edinburgh, and usually I lead in-person tours of central London that focus on some really important sites in African-American history, American history in general, British history, transatlantic history. Um, and obviously because of COVID, I've had to put a pause on that, but it's allowed me to develop the, the talks and tours online. So um, you will be walking through the streets of London with me today as we explore six sites in the heart of the capital. And the tour usually lasts about an hour and 20 minutes, hour and a half, depending on how many questions there are. And I realize that might be quite a lot of you for a lot of time for some of you, you might be juggling childcare, work, just general life commitments. So um, obviously just please stay for as long as you can. And thank you so much for, um, for being here. So what I'm gonna do over the next hour and 20 minutes or so is I'm going to share my screen with you to show you a PowerPoint of some of the images of the people I'm going to be talking about. These three are, the, um, are some of the folks I'll talk about. Um, and also show my screen um, so you can see where we, where we would be standing um, if we were actually in person together in central London. So just before um, I start, I also want to point out a content warning. I'm gonna be talking about slavery, racism, white supremacy, white domestic terrorism. So it's really important to be aware of that and be upfront with that. And I think that's particularly relevant right now as we're living in a global pandemic, which is disproportionately affecting people of color. And obviously as we're still seeing Black Lives Matter protests take place around the US, but also here in the UK as well. And the people that I'm going to be talking about today who were African-American activists, survivors of US slavery, traveling all the way to Britain and Ireland, they were emphasizing this international philosophy of black rights, of human rights, civil rights. And they were declaring way back in the 19th century that their black lives mattered as well. And as early as 1838, Moses Roper, who you can see here on the left-hand side, he declared to an English audience, you have heard the slaveholders' side of the story. It is now time for the slaves to speak. And activists like Roper had well recognized and knew that slavery had polluted the American landscape. landscape. And I use that word pollution very deliberately because African Americans talked about slavery in those terms, like a disease, like pollution. Frederick Douglass, who we see here in the middle, and I'm sure most of you have heard of, he said to an English audience in 1846 that US slavery was a cancer that was eating America's vitals. And that's a direct quote from him. And Interestingly, a few years later, the Reverend Henry Highland Garnet said to an Irish audience in sort of similar language that the US nation was staggering under the putrid corpse of American slavery. And again, that's a direct quote. So again, the sort of language of pollution and disease. And folks like Moses Roper, Frederick Douglass, Henry Highland Garnet, well knew that America had failed to live up to its own self-professed declarations of freedom. They talked about the hypocrisy of American independence and in, instead of uh, curing that disease of slavery or getting rid of that pollution, um, they obviously did nothing about it. Um, now it's well documented that the social justice movements of today have a lot of parallels with the 19th century and with some of the activists that I'm going to be talking about today, obviously Frederick Douglass is a really key and important example. We also have here on the right hand side, and some of you might recognize her, the brilliant and inspiring Ida B. Wells Barnett. There are a lot of parallels between her anti-lynching campaign in the 19th century 
with um, what's going on today with contemporary brutality against people of colour in the UK and in the US. And I'm going to be talking about Ida B. Wells Barnett a little bit later as well. But interestingly, Britain has its own legacies to deal with as well. We still tend to focus on the abolition of the slave trade, which took place in 1807, and the abolition of slavery across the entire British Empire that happened about the late 1830s. What we haven't really come to terms with and what we don't really focus on is that in order to enact that abolition, for those of you in the US who might not be aware, the British government paid compensation to enslavers, not the enslaved, to enslavers at a cost of around uh, 20 million pounds, which at that time in the 1830s was 40% of the British government's expenditure. And obviously today that would be billions uh, and billions of pounds. And in the 18th century and in the early 19th century, in order to um, enact the abolition of the slave trade, for example, black abolitionists were really central in campaigning for anti-slavery, folks like Alada Equiano or Mary Prince you may have heard of. But what's really interesting is that African Americans who were coming over to Brit Britain in the 19th century, and I'll get to some of those reasons why they were coming over in a minute, but they were unafraid of pointing out British racism, how the British government had to essentially compensate or pay those enslavers instead of the enslaved. They pointed out how Britain had a central role in developing racist thought across the Atlantic and across the world. And one of my favorite quotes to illustrate this was by a man called the Reverend Samuel Ringold Ward, who said to a York audience in 1854, that since the Tudor times, and again, I'll quote, um, English soil was reddened with the blood of my race. So he really talks about colonialism there and um, uh, obviously um, targeting and uh, oppressing people of color. And in this particular meeting, the other thing that he does is that he criticizes the British government for its lackluster response to the fact that black British sailors were docking in American ports like Charleston, Savannah, and they were actually being sold and seized and kidnapped into US slavery and the British government did nothing about it. So he was really sort of targeting the British government there. And again, just to sort of finally say before I go into the main tour, uh, Britain really struggles with that history, with racism and the fact that, you know, like in the US, um, we have our own problems with statues, memorials, should we memorialize certain individuals, should we take those memorials down? And some of those memorials are essentially commemorating enslavers. So you might have seen last year in June, the statue of Edward Colston was taken down from its plinth in Bristol and dumped unceremoniously into the harbour, the same a harbour where Colston, who was um, a slave trafficker, essentially um, brought in Africans um, to Bristol. And he was responsible for the trafficking of between 80 and 100,000 Africans on the Middle Passage alone. Okay, so here we go then. And I should say, um, I, uh, feel free to type your questions in the Q&A or in the chat box and at the end of each stop I'll sort of pause and try and answer a couple of questions and then answer the majority at the end but please do sort of feel free to keep them coming if you have them and I'll do my best to answer them. Okay so this was where we would be walking if we were in person together so we would start at Freemasons Hall, uh, head down towards the Strand and then back up towards Hoban Town Hall. And just to give you an idea about where we are in London, we are right next to Covent Garden, um, just towards the left of this map. You have Leicester Square and Piccadilly Circus, if you know these important sites in London. Um, we're about 15, 20 minutes walk from Buckingham Palace. And obviously down at the bottom here, we've got the Thames. I just get up a, another website, which hopefully, hopefully you can see this map and I'll put up the link to this website or my website in the chat box in a little bit. But my research essentially focuses on 
we're covering the, the history and the testimonies of African-American activists with a primary focus on those who escaped and or survived US slavery and traveled across the Atlantic to lecture in Britain and Ireland during the 19th century. Now, I know a lot of you are based in the US, so you might know this, but I'll just give a really brief recap. So slavery had existed in the Americas since the 16th century. It had become firmly entrenched by the Amer American Revolution. Slavery had become sort of gradually abolished in the Northern states by the early 19th century, but it had become fully entrenched in the Southern states of the US. And it would take the Civil War, fought between 1861 and 1865, which led to the legal abolition of slavery at the end of that war. And note, I'm using the word legal very deliberately there. But the period that I'm going to be talking about, which is uh, mainly the 1840s and the 1850s, there are around 4 million enslaved African Americans across the US South. And as I'm sure you'll know, from the beginning, African Americans resisted their oppression in, in numerous ways from becoming freedom seekers and running to the northern states, forming marine communities within their own state where they had been enslaved and traveling uh, up to the north through the Underground Railroad, for example, to Canada and even to Britain and Ireland. And on the site of enslavement itself, they also fought back against their enslavers, their slave breakers, their oppressors in numerous ways from actual physical violence to breaking tools, stealing food, holding secret meetings, sometimes running away just for two or three days to deny their oppressor of labor and then returning. But those of whom who managed to escape slavery, they formed the heart of the transatlantic anti-slavery movement. Black women and men wrote about their experiences of slavery and slave narratives. They spoke about their experiences of slavery on abolitionist platforms. They composed their own poetry and paintings and exhibited them to audiences in the US. And of course, they came over to Britain and Ireland. They braved the Atlantic crossing, which at that period would have taken any time between um, nine days and two weeks, depending on how kind the ocean was being. And they traveled into ports like Liverpool, which is on the, the west coast of England here. And what I've tried to do through my research and on my website here is I've tried to map as many speaking locations as possible. And at the moment, it's a little bit of a daunting task because this represents a mere fraction of the actual number of speeches given throughout the 19th century. But I've managed to map about 4,700 speeches on this map. And as you can see, they were taking place around Britain and Ireland. And I think there are so many things that we can look at in this map. If you, if you know sort of the British Isles at all, what's really interesting is that when you go into the map, the circles sort of dissipate. So you can actually um, zoom in on a particular location and a, a pinned point will tell you who spoke there, the date if we know it, the venue if we know it, and any other information. But African-Americans were quite literally going into the Highlands, up to the Orkney Islands, all the way through Scotland. They were speaking in large towns like, obviously, as we would expect, London, Edinburgh, Manchester, Liverpool. But they were also speaking in small fishing villages, tiny rural locations like Keswick in the Lake District, like Bakewell in the Peak District. You would have, if you know Wales at all, this is Snowdonia National Park, just sort of left of center here. And uh, obviously it wasn't a national park in the 19th century, but you have African-Americans speaking at the foot of Snowdon in a place called Lamberis in Wales. So incredibly rural locations, as well as fishing villages. This is the Isle of Wight here and going all the way down to Cornwall. They were literally speaking from Cornwall all the way to John O'Groats. So from one corner, um, of England to the far reaches of Scotland. And as you can see, there were far more lectures taking place outside of London. And there are a lot of reasons for that. I won't go into all of them now. Feel free to ask a question if you'd like to know a little bit more about that.
but a lot of it has to do with abolitionist networks. There were a lot of abolitionists based in, for example, the industrial north of England, so Birmingham, Manchester, Leeds, Liverpool, even Newcastle as well. So if there was a, an abolitionist network, a black activist would come over to Britain and Ireland and essentially stop off at these places in a circle or you know, within this network and hold lectures in those particular locations. But why were they coming here more specifically? So African-Americans obviously came to Britain and Ireland to inform transatlantic audiences about slavery and racism. And they did that in multiple ways. So as you'll see from the map, they did that through speaking on political or anti-slavery platforms. They also wrote slave narratives, these protest documents, which became a central part of the anti-slavery movement and also American literary history and culture in general. But what's interesting is on this side of the Atlantic, the literary and uh, commercial success of these slave narratives has actually largely been forgotten. And when we compare the sales of some of these slave narratives to the Victorian authors that we know of today, in a lot of um, times and locations, African-Americans were outselling, at least in initial sales, popular Victorian authors. So just to give you an example, Frederick Douglass sold 13,000 copies of his narrative between 1845 and 1847. Josiah Henson sold a quarter of a million copies of his slave narrative between 1876 and 1877. Now, when we look at the initial sales of um, authors like Lewis Carroll. He published Alice in Wonderland in 1865, and in three years he published about 13,000 copies. So in terms of initial sales, Frederick Douglass and Josiah Henson completely outsold Lewis Carroll. And even we look to the end of the century, so the 1890s, when Bram Stoker published Dracula, initial sales for that novel were quite low, about 3,000 within the first year and a half, um, which was completely dwarfed by the sales um, of these narratives by freedom seekers on British soil. So other reasons why folks were coming over to Britain was they were encouraging audiences to sign anti-slavery petitions, to practice what they called non-fellowship with enslavers or slaveholding churches, they raised money for specific anti-slavery societies like the American Anti-Slavery Society, the Canadian Anti-Slavery Society, and they also raised money to purchase their legal freedom or the freedom of their wives, their children or relatives. So when you escaped from slavery, technically in the eyes of the law and through the eyes of the US government, you were still legally enslaved. So British abolitionists would sometimes quite crudely enter into a negotiation with their former enslaver, raise donations to purchase their legal freedom, and then their enslaver would draw up effectively what was called a bill of sale. So for example, in Newcastle, which is here, the Richardson sisters purchased the legal freedom of Frederick Douglass and William Wells Brown, so by the time they returned to the US, they were legally free because they had this bill of sale. Other reasons, uh, some activists wanted to encourage audiences to boycott slave produced goods. So in the 1850s, 90% of the cotton that was being imported into Liverpool, so a former slave trading port, was actually slave grown. It was coming from the US South. So Britain actually sort of promoted and sustained US slavery, at least economically. And you had activists like James Watkins who said to one audience, and as much as possible throughout the tour, I'm going to be reading the words and the testimonies of these activists themselves. And he said to one audience, if you could hear the groans of the slaves and witness for a moment their sufferings, you would never again touch Savannah rice. You would feel like you were eating the blood and bones of the Negroes. 
So Watkins is essentially saying uh, the audiences should be a lot more thoughtful and aware of the products that they are buying and consuming on a daily basis, which is obviously still relevant for us today. And a final reason why they were coming over here was to temporarily or permanently work, so find employment or also to live. But as I say, primarily they were sharing their testimony about slavery and, and racism. And you would expect African-American visits to perhaps tailor off after the end of the Civil War with the legal abolition of slavery, but there were hundreds of lectures that took place between 1865 and the end of the century because African-Americans were still coming over to lecture about the legacies of slavery, the convict lease system, the high numbers of incarceration of people of color, and also lynching and white domestic terrorism by groups like the KKK and the Knights of the White Camellia. But before I move on, the other thing to touch on is what were they actually talking about in these lectures that we're looking at right now? And in their lectures, they spoke about obviously the brutality, the reality of slavery. They spoke about the, the rape and brutalization of black women. They spoke about their own escape. They talked about the separation of families on the auction block, the hypocrisy of American independence in the 4th of July, while there were still millions of enslaved people in the US. They um, spoke about the history of the anti-slavery movement, the racism they experienced in the US and also in the UK. And they also talked about black heroic figures like Toussaint Louverture and the Haitian Revolution, uh, Madison Washington, and also Margaret Garner. And if you aren't familiar with Margaret Garner's story, she escaped with her husband and her children. And when cornered by slave catchers, she actually slit the throat of her youngest daughter because she did not want her to grow up and live in slavery. Now, in terms of their lectures as well, they were speaking to all different types of audiences. So upper class, the aristocracy, um, middle class, working class audiences, sometimes specifically working class audiences. And if they were in a working class community, for example, if there was a fee involved in the lecture, sometimes you had to pay, sometimes it was free. But if there was some kind of payment, they would um, offer a discount to essentially entice the working class community of the area to come to the lecture. And the other thing is they were speaking to children's groups as well, children's audiences. OK, so you can if you are interested in this history, you can explore this website in, in your own time. I've got a few maps on there to sort of illustrate this history. This one we're looking at right now is a heat map showing the concentration of lectures. And as I was saying earlier, it really shows that while there were a lot of lectures taking place in London, there were a high concentration of lectures taking place around Manchester and Leeds, Newcastle, and also in Edinburgh and Glasgow as well. But this is where we would start the tour. So this is the first stop. I know that was a little bit of a preamble. So thank you for bearing with me. Um, this is quite a niche history. So it takes a little bit of time to set up. And I promise you not every stop will be that long. But this is Freemasons Hall. So it was opened in the sort of early 18th century. And as well as Masonic events, it was a really important venue in London's social life. So balls were held here, lectures, social reform meetings, charity balls, things like that. And part of the front of the building was redesigned after the First World War to serve as a memorial to the 3000 members of the order who died during the conflict. And it's a great place to start because there were several African Americans who spoke here. So I've already mentioned two of them, the Reverend Henry Highland Garnet and the Reverend Samuel Ringold Ward. 
They spoke here in 1851 and 1853, respectively. And we also have the Reverend Alexander Crummel, who also spoke here in 1853. And Crummel was a, an activist, an African nationalist, uh, a speaker, an orator, and a preacher as well. And he's regarded as one of the first people of color to graduate from the University of Cambridge. He graduated in the mid 1850s. And one of the colleges sort of claim him to be the first person of color to graduate from the university um, entire. And it's obviously, well, it's likely that there were other students of color before Crummel, but he's regarded as the first person on the roster, if you like. But the main person I want to tell you about today is Josiah Henson, who spoke here in 1851. Now, Henson is a really interesting figure. He was born in Maryland in 1789. He escaped slavery with his wife and children and settled in Canada. He was a community activist, um, a really powerful orator, soldier, preacher, and he was the only person of color to exhibit something at the Great Exhibition in London in 1851. But Henson is most famously known for his association with the character of Uncle Tom from Harriet Beecher Stowe's famous anti-slavery novel, Uncle Tom's Cabin, which was published in 1852. Now, I'm sure some of you have heard of this novel. It was a transatlantic success Within a year in Britain alone, that novel had sold over a million copies. And if you were walking the streets of London, you could go and watch about 13 or 14 Uncle Tom's Cabin productions in Christmas 1853. You could buy Uncle Tom's uh, Cabin, Uncle Tom's Cabin even wallpaper. You could go and have a coffee at Uncle Tom's Cabin coffee house. You get the idea. It was incredibly popular on this side of the Atlantic as it was of course in the US. Now Stowe had apparently read Josiah Henson's slave narrative, which was first published in 1849. And she partly based one of the main characters of the novel, Uncle Tom, on Henson's life story. Now this claim gets um, some criticism from some historians. I'm not necessarily interested whether this claim was accurate or not. I think it's interesting to be able to see what Henson did with this association because he what he does initially is that he plays up this association so he republishes another narrative a couple of years later and uses it as a benchmark for people to be who were interested in Stowe's novel that they would also read his book as a way of actually understanding the realities of slavery because Stowe as a white American woman had no idea about racism and about slavery whereas Henson who had actually experienced slavery himself could use the novel and his association with it as as I say a sort of benchmark to really teach American audiences about those realities of slavery. Now interestingly two decades after the novel was first published Henson returns to Britain in 1876 and 1877. He travels around for about eight months. And he comes over because he needs to raise some money to pay off his mortgage. A lot of his finances had been tied in with his community activism in Canada. And he works with a white reformer and journalist, John Lobb. And Lobb has a lot of connections around London and around Britain and they organize a, a lecturing tour. And Lobb markets Henson as the Uncle Tom. That's the phrase that Lobb wants to associate with Henson. And this tour is really successful. Henson speaks to half a million people in six months, which is pretty impressive, but even more impressive when, if you've done the math by now, he's 88 at this point. So, a, I've already mentioned that a revised edition of his slave narrative was published in 1876 and along with the children's edition of his story um, that sells a quarter of a million copies within about a year and a half. And as you can see from the image on the right hand side, Henson is invited to, to meet Queen Victoria in March 1877 at Windsor Castle and even more 
um, uh, crazy, I would say, is that a model of Henson's likeness essentially is constructed in Madame Two Swords in central London. But just before I finish up on this particular stop, this relationship with this fictional character becomes very tiresome and is incredibly complex. So I mentioned that when the novel first came out, there were a lot of dramatic productions of Uncle Tom's Cabin. That was still very much the case in the 1870s. You could travel all across Britain and there were numerous Uncle Tom's Cabin performances that were also uh, heavily influenced and sometimes the subject of minstrel shows. So these grotesque um, shows that white people went to um, to essentially witness people um, wearing makeup and, and having those distorted and racialized features um, to depict people of color. And the figure of Uncle Tom had been sort of co-opted into this minstrel stereotype. So there are times when we look at Henson's tour where he's introduced as the Uncle Tom and he gets up on stage and says, my name isn't Uncle Tom, my name is Josiah Henson. I don't want any other name um, called or directed towards me uh, in the newspapers other than my own. And unfortunately, the newspapers don't really listen to him. The headlines are always Uncle Tom in London, Uncle Tom in Scotland, wherever. But I think that that's one of the reasons why he wrestles with this character, because on the one hand, it's brought him fame and fortune, but on the other, it has really complex connections to quite racist stereotypes. Okay, thank you so much for listening to me for the first stop. I just quickly go through some of the chat box to see if anyone's got any questions, including in the um, Q&A. Um, again, feel free to keep typing questions and, uh, and hopefully um, I'll be able to get to, um, uh, um, get to some of them. There's already some great information in the chat box that's being exchanged about Frederick Douglass and John Sella Martin, um, uh, which is really great. So that's lovely to read and keep that coming. Um, okay, and I'm also so... keeping an eye on the chat and the Q&A. Oh, fantastic. So, so we can double team it. All right, perfect, amazing. Um, so yeah, there's a question here about slavery uh, being legal in the UK. Yes, we did have slavery on the UK mainland. That's something that um, the British nation doesn't really um, uh, deal with at all. One of the reasons and what's really fascinating and, and actually linking back to what I was saying about Uncle Tom's Cabin is that part of the reason why British culture and British people are fascinated um, and tend to sort of stick to the story of Uncle Tom's Cabin is because it allows them an element of smugness and moral superiority because legally Britain had abolished slavery in the slave trade, um, but obviously America still had slavery. So they were essentially um, digesting and devouring these stories about American slavery without actually coming to terms with the legacies of enslavement on their own soil, but also in particular in the Caribbean and the West Indies, where a lot of British enslavers um, enslaved um, millions uh, of, um, uh, of Africans. Um, and I will, sorry, there's a couple of people um, just asking about the link to my website, which I will just pop in the chat box. Um, perfect. Okay, um, and just one more last question. Um, do you have any information on Mary Webb who toured England giving dramatic readings of Uncle Tom's Cabin? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, I don't actually talk about Mary Webb in the tour, um, but I've read a lot of newspaper adverts about her lecturing tour. The, one of the interesting things about the newspaper articles is that along with other descriptions of black women and um, black American women who either gave lectures or were on an anti-slavery platform. A lot of them are obviously racialized and um, written through sort of Victorian racial and gender dynamics. So women are described as being sort of civilized and refined and genteel um, uh, in that kind of language. Um, but Mary Webb is actually really popular. She performs to a lot of the aristocracy in Britain. And again, she really taps into the fact that Uncle Tom's Cabin is such a huge, huge success, uh, a huge success here. Um, 
And uh, again, sorry, someone's saying about Sarah Parker Remond. I'm going to be mentioning her a little bit um, uh, in a little bit later, but she was a fantastic figure. If you are interested in this history, Sarah Parker Remond plays a really important role in the transatlantic anti-slavery movement. Um, and she um, leads a very successful anti-slavery lecturing tour in the late 1850s and early 1860s. And just before I carry on, there's another great question here about um, the financing, the speaking tours. Um, so depending on uh, which black activists we're talking about, they might be supported by various societies. So for example, Samuel Ringold Ward is sponsored by the Canadian Anti-Slavery Society to travel over here so that he doesn't necessarily have to pay for his steamship ticket and things like that. Um, and then donations from meetings sometimes cover his expenses, but also if a society has certain connections to abolitionists in Britain, then Ward can go and stay in those homes. And a better example of that is Frederick Douglass. So in, in his first anti-slavery tour of Britain in 1845, he works with William Lloyd Garrison, so the white radical abolitionist based out of Boston. And Garrison has spent years accumulating these contacts of abolitionists around Britain and Ireland. So that means that when Douglas comes over, his passage is paid by abolitionists, but there's already these hubs of cities where he can go to that um, he can stay in places like Dublin and Ireland, Bristol in England um, and Edinburgh in Scotland, and he can stay with certain families. And the benefit of that is not only does he not have to pay expenses in things like hotels and bars and taverns and stuff, uh, and other places, but also he's given food and he's also introduced to other abolitionists, you know, hit, go and meet my cousin, go and stay my cousin, with my cousin in this particular location so that he doesn't have to pay those expenses. Um, and a lot of these networks were sort of middle class merchants, printers, um, newspaper editors, so they could write favorable coverage of his lectures, which then maximizes the anti-slavery cause. Um, and you have folks like the Esslin family in Bristol, who Douglas goes and stays with. He stays with them for about a week. And then Esslin says, OK, we're not Quakers, but I've got a friend who's a Quaker. So you go and stay with him for a week because that will introduce you to a different circle than that we work within. So you'll be able to maximize the cause even further. And he's quite well off and he prints about 3000 handbills for one lecture. So a handbill was basically um, um, a flyer with all of the details of the lecture on them and stuff like that. So obviously if you've got someone literally going out there and handing handbills to people in the street, you're gonna get more people coming to your meeting. Okay, thank you for all the questions and I will try and get to a few of them later. So what we would do now to get to the second stop if we were all in person is we would turn on our backs and head towards Covent Garden, which if you're not familiar with central London is in this general direction. And we would get to Bow Street, which or where you can access the Royal Opera House. Uh, this is in Covent Garden in London. And there's been three theatres on this site since 1732. The current theatre that we're looking at dates from around 1858, which was just over a decade after Frederick Douglass spoke here in 1846. Now, I'm sure a lot of you have heard, or most of you have heard of Frederick Douglass. He was obviously the most famous African-American of the 19th century, a radical activist for abolition, equality, feminism, and social justice. And he led an unrelenting fight against slavery, racism, and white supremacy his entire life. And he was an incredible speaker, author, poet, journalist, editor, just to name a few. And his escape from slavery in 1838, with the integral help of his future wife, Anna Murray, would signal a dramatic turning point in the anti-slavery movement. And I always like to mention Anna because often a lot of historians tend to erase or invisibilize her contributions quite, quite off, well, quite bluntly, I should say. Um, there would not be a Frederick Douglass without Anna Murray Douglas. When Douglas was lecturing for 10 months out of the year or indeed was in Britain for nearly two years, Anna Murray Douglas was running the Underground Railroad from their house. She was running the household. She was raising the children. All of those were activist roles in their own right. And um, what I've tried to do in my research is that I actually started doing this research 
or started my research with uncovering facts about Frederick Douglass's journey to Britain and Ireland. And I've got a book out shortly that deals with some of this history. But essentially, Frederick Douglass travels to England in 1845. It's just after the publication of his best-selling slave narrative. He has to essentially come over to Britain in part because of the unwanted attention from his former enslavers after the publication of that work. But he was a sensation here. He spoke around 300 times to hundreds of thousands of people between 1845 and 1847. And in his own words, he exposed slavery because to expose it is to kill it. Slavery is one of those monsters of darkness to whom the light of truth is death. By ripping the mask from its face, it would be exposed to the sun and with a wall of anti-slavery fire, it would burn away from the land. And he was so popular that tickets often had to be issued for his meetings. And there are some really great anecdotes in the British press that really attest to his fame. Um, so one of my favorites is in Colchester in March 1847, just before he goes home, he speaks in a church and hundreds of people crown themselves into this church to listen to him. Hundreds of people are quite literally turned away, but a few enterprising folk actually go to the side of the church and crane their necks to listen through an open window. They're so desperate to hear Douglas speak. I've already mentioned his slave narrative, which published a, it's a revised edition is published in Dublin and also in England. It sells about 13,000 copies. And I also mentioned that some uh, Newcastle uh, abolitionists, the Richardson family, raised the money to not only purchase Douglas's legal freedom, but also collect donations to buy Douglas a printing press. So by the time he returns to the US, he can actually begin his career as a journalist and a newspaper editor. Douglas had a very significant impact on Britain and Ireland, but also it went the other way around as well. British or Douglas corresponded with British and Irish abolitionists for the rest of his life. They often sustained him throughout his personal life and his political activism until the very day he died. Now, Douglas's fame made him center stage in Covent Garden in August, 1846 at the World Temperance Convention. So this convention was essentially made up of white reformers from the UK and the US who had gathered together to essentially discuss the state of temperance in the world at that point. And all of these reformers, Douglas included, he was a temperance man as well, believed in the reduction or the complete um, abolition of alcohol itself because they believed that alcohol was a sin, that it, caused poverty, led to domestic abuse and violence, um, and by getting rid of alcohol, society would essentially be a better place. So there are a lot of speeches at this convention about um, the progress of temperance. And Douglas was invited to speak one night about his views on temperance. And again, because he was so committed to anti-slavery and anti-racism, Douglas uses his allotted time to expose the actions of white temperance societies that excluded people of color from membership. And also he pointed to white uh, mobs attacking peaceful black temperance demonstrators in cities like Philadelphia. Uh, he pointed to this example, which had happened a few years before in 1842, just outside of Philadelphia. Now, the crowd really loved Douglas's speech, um, but there were several white Americans in the audience who did not share that sentiment. So there was the Reverend Samuel Hanson Cox from Brooklyn, New York, and he started a public exchange with Douglas. After the meeting, he denounced his conduct. He accused him of being paid by abolitionists to disrupt the meeting. And Cox said he was an abolitionist, but um, essentially said that Douglas launched revengeful missiles against our country. And that's a direct quote. And I'm sure you'll see some of the language is, is quite familiar with today's politics and in the US a little bit too. And Douglas replies in this letter, so you claim to be a Christian, a philanthropist and an abolitionist. Were you truly entitled to any one of these names, you would have been delighted at seeing one of Africa's children cordially received and warmly welcomed. 
This tells the whole story of your abolitionism and stamps your pretensions to abolition as brazen hypocrisy or self-deception. Now, just while I'm touching on themes of racism within the anti-slavery movement, I want to introduce you to Moses Roper. I've done a lot of research on Roper over the last few years, and his story deserves to be a lot more well-known than, um, than it currently is. So Roper was born in 1815 in Caswell County, North Carolina. He suffered from horrendous abuse and torture at the hands of his enslavers. By his count, he tried to escape slavery between 16 and 20 times. Each time he was arrested, incarcerated and tortured. He manages to escape in 1834. The following year, he comes over to England after slave catchers try and snatch him from New York. He is not safe on US soil. So he arrives in England and he works with several white abolitionists, including a man called Thomas Price, who provides him with some financial assistance to go to several schools in London. As we know, under enslavement, it was forbidden and punishable by death if enslaved people learned to read or write. Roper is here in London and he publishes a slave narrative in 1837. It's one of the first slave narratives published by an African-American on British soil. And it's one of the first slave narratives in the Atlantic or across the Atlantic that includes illustrations. Roper included illustrations depicting his own torture. So Roper initially works with several abolitionists, including this man, Thomas Price, but several years into his journey around Britain, and he lectured thousands of times across Great Britain and Ireland. He publishes 38,000 copies of his slave narrative, including 5,000 copies purely in the Welsh language when he's traveling to all of these rural communities in Wales. And he expresses a desire to be a missionary to the African continent. And Price gives him a little bit of money towards this or gives him advice. And a couple of years later, again, as we're all prone to do, Roper actually changes his mind. He decides not to become a missionary and Price is incensed. He believes that Roper was essentially taking the money and running, that he was preying on his own philanthropy. And Ro uh, Price decides to write a public letter to ruin Roper's reputation and denounce him in the public press. So he writes this letter in 1840 and calls Roper a beggar and a liar and that people shouldn't, um, shouldn't show him support. And this is incredibly damaging to Roper's career and, uh, and personal life. Roper writes a letter back to try and defend his reputation and basically says that um, before Price's letter, he, his expenses were relatively small. He could stay with certain abolitionists. He didn't have to pay for certain hotels and things like that. After Price's letter, it completely um, ruins his chances. He can't go and speak in certain places because people physically close their doors to him. He has to go and stay in hotels, which obviously increase his expenses. And it makes it really difficult for Roper to try and meet the debts to um, his printers, for example, that print the slave narrative. So it, it, he, it has a really devastating impact on Roper. He's terrified that he is going to be incarcerated in an English debtor's prison. Again, given his history of incarceration and torture, this would have been incredibly traumatic for him. And by this point, I think the other thing about Price and a lot of um, uh, white society and white abolitionists at the time, Roper had married a white English woman. So this would have been an interracial marriage, which uh, a lot of white people would have um, thought repulsive and did think was repulsive. But just, I just want to end on Roper's story by saying that despite all of the troubles that he experienced at the hands of white abolitionists, he, were, he always told the truth about his experiences. He was unafraid of challenging white fragility and uh, he often was criticised by the press or by audience members in his lectures um, because along this sort of white racist schema in which the society was living under, when Roper was telling all these graphic stories about what happened to him because he was unrelenting in those graphic descriptions, a lot of these white newspaper correspondents and white audience members challenged him and said that physically doesn't happen on US soil, you're lying and you're making it up. And I will just finish on one story. 
Um, he was in a Methodist meeting house in Birmingham and he was telling stories about how the Methodist um, churches enslaved people in the US. And he was speaking, as I say, in a Methodist meeting house to Methodists with Methodists on the meeting platform who were supporting him. This led to uproar and they, the, several Methodists in the meeting basically got up and said, you can't carry on unless you apologize and recount what you're saying about the Methodist religion and the Methodists in the US. And there was a lot of commotion. And as soon as it sort of started to settle down, as it looked like Roper was going to stand up and say something and apologize, the only thing Roper said was, my mother was enslaved by a Methodist. And as you can imagine, the whole meeting broke up. So that's Roper's story. Okay, so um, I uh, would just have a quick look through the questions. When was slavery abolished in Britain? Yeah, sorry, you might have missed that. I didn't realize there's a lot of information um, coming out. So the British government abolished the slave trade in 1807, slavery uh, in the British Empire by the end of the 1830s. Um, did Roper or other abolitionists have other um, sources of income either in the US or the UK? So with Roper in particular, um, he, his financial survival was actually tied to the sale of his slave narrative. So as he was going around meetings, sometimes there'd be donations to him, um, but he would try and sell his slave narrative at the end of every meeting, which makes the um, a letter from Price more devastating because if he's not going to those meetings, then he can't necessarily earn money to pay for those debts. Um, but other African Americans sought some form of temporary employment, um, as well as um, sort of you know those donations from from lectures and stuff like that. Um, no, another great question, were black abolitionists able to stay in any hotel or were many hotels restrictive? So I should say at this point, um, Britain, again, like the US was based on a white supremacist society. It was racist towards people of color. Often when we tell these stories, it looks like Britain and Britain painted itself as this haven for African-Americans who were coming over and giving lectures. Um, but African-Americans, Frederick Douglass and obviously Moses Roper included did experience racism here. But in a lot of their writings and speeches, they did talk about how compared to the US, um, racism functioned slightly differently in that they were able, if they had sort of connections to, you know, middle class networks and abolitionists and friends, they were able to stay in hotels that, you know, Frederick Douglass has this famous phrase of, I can dine anywhere I want, I can stay anywhere I want, I can walk around the British Museum, I can go into um, like a zoo in England and I'm not um, forced out, um, whereas he couldn't do that even in Boston or New York. Um, so there is obviously a stark difference between how racism operates. Um, and But again, I'm always very cautious to say that doesn't mean that they didn't um, experience uh, racism there as well. Um, okay, so thank you so I much. I have for... two questions for you. Oh yeah, go for it. Um, so th first of all, thanks for hosting our group today. This was fascinating. We have several hundred people watching on Zoom and Facebook. So thank you very much. Um, two kind of more personal questions. How did you get started researching this topic and how did you get initially get interested in this? And then can you tell us a little bit more about what you're working on now, you're, the research you're doing now, like you mentioned um, briefly, the book that you're working on. Can you tell us a little bit more about that and when we can expect it? Yes, thank you. So I got into this research about 10 years ago and it was very much through the lens of um, finding out about Frederick Douglass's time in Britain and Ireland and going through the newspapers and other sources to try and understand why he was so successful here and actually sort of recovering and promoting the testimony, which some of it has been published in the US, but some of it hasn't actually um, been found before. So um, I have a book out at the moment called Advocates of Freedom that came out last year and I'm working on uh, a book that's currently going through the proof stage so it should be out in April or May COVID depending I think and that's very much an anthology focusing on Frederick Douglass's time in Britain and Ireland so there's an extensive introduction which 
um, deals with um, Douglas in the UK and Ireland. And then also there's some sources. So there's some speeches that haven't been published anywhere before. Um, poetry, letters by Douglas to the British press and British abolitionists. Um, and uh, some uh, poetry as well written in response um, to his lectures. Um, and at the moment, I'm sort of working on finishing up that and working on the life of Moses Roper and um, other African Americans too. So thank you for that, Robert. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and then what okay. about, so what about also to one more question. So you mentioned you were showing like pictures and stuff when you do the in-person tours. When mm -hmm. someone um, goes on one of those, whether they're from the UK or the US or somewhere else in Europe, is there a particular thing that um, surprises them that they they didn't expect to see? Or like, what's the most um, maybe thing that they didn't expect to see that um, they hear from you or get to see in person on the tour? Any particular thing stand out? Yeah, I think the reason the... I ask because at some point in time when COVID ends, our group's going to come to London. Yes, tour. please. We'll go, I love we'll go that. on this tour. So kind of as a sneak preview. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, but yeah, that would be lovely. I think um, what's interesting about the in-person tours is a lot of the in-person tours tend to be people from London. So a lot of the surprising things is, A, I didn't know about this history at all, um, you know, and for those of you who, who who know London really well, all of the sites that I go to are very, very central and they would have walked past them tons of times without realizing the history or some of these stories. Um, but I think when I do the virtual talks, what's lovely, obviously I'm connecting to sort of American folks and Canadian folks as well, is that there seems to be, this history doesn't necessarily, uh, it isn't taught in schools or it isn't really taught that much. So the kind of transatlantic element of the anti-slavery movement isn't something that's well known. And in Britain too, this sort of African-American side of the anti-slavery movement with, and their work with British abolitionists sort of isn't very well known either. So it, it's that kind of really difficult. And that's why I describe it as quite a niche history, even though it shouldn't be. Um, but it's, it's just something that isn't necessarily taught in schools in either location really. Um, so that would be that would be the other thing too. But yeah, those are great oh, questions. Awesome, thank you. thank you. Yeah. Okay, so I'm conscious of time. So I, I know people are still asking questions and I will get to some of those as much as I can. But um, so uh, what we would normally do is if we were in person, we'll head towards the third stop. This looks like a very boring street, but if we would walk down Bow Street, in normal times, we would walk past the Lyceum Theatre where um, uh, The Lion King is usually performed. Um, so let me just get up my, uh, sorry, I was actually going to show you this place first. So this is the Strand uh, and this is the Strand Palace Hotel. And for those of you unfamiliar with London, you can just make out Nelson's column here right at the very end where this is Trafalgar Square. And so this is actually my favorite stop on the tour, not because, I mean, I, I do love the Strand and I love the, the hotel and I love everything about the streets, um, but also because it was the site of Exeter Hall. So I've just got an old map of London here showing Exeter Hall just towards the left of centre here. And again, this main street is the Strand. And Exeter Hall was built in 1831, unfortunately destroyed in 1907 but it was a really famous place for anti-slavery and reform meetings. So it could hold, or one auditorium of Exeter Hall could hold about 5,000 people, slightly smaller room could hold about 1,000 people. And because of its fame as an anti-slavery venue, there were several African-Americans who spoke here. So we know that Frederick Douglass spoke here in 1846, um, and I should say as well, this is what the exterior of the hall would have looked like on the left hand side. And on the right hand side, this is actually an illustration from an anti corn law meeting in 1846. But knowing that Douglas spoke here in 1846, I like to try and imagine that this is what the hall would have looked like when he gave his lecture there. But there were other Americans who spoke here too. So John Anderson spoke here in 1861. Uh, he's on the right hand side there. And also William Wells Brown, who by his count traveled about 25,000 miles across Britain lecturing about anti-slavery. 
He published a slave narrative and also a travel narrative, which is a really wonderful read about his travels essentially um, around Britain and Ireland. And I should say, you can read all of these narratives for free online at Documenting the US South. Um, it's a project based out of North Carolina. I've just put the uh, named, I haven't put the link there, but you should Google it and it should come up. And you can read all of these narratives for free there. The other really great thing about Brown is that he published a fiction work called Clotel. He published that in London in 1853. And a lot of historians regard it as one of the first fiction books published by an African-American um, in the across the Atlantic. And the other thing to say about Brown, there are lots of things we could say about him, but by, when he goes back to the US, he actually writes and performs in his own plays. But the folks I want to talk to you about today are William and Ellen Craft. William lectured at Exeter Hall in the early 1850s. And they were born just outside of Macon in Georgia and over Christmas in 1848 resolved to escape slavery. Now, Ellen at the time was described as, as having quite a fair complexion. That was the result of her mother's rape by her enslaver. But essentially she could pass for a white person. So William and Ellen devised this really um, risky and ingenious escape plan that Ellen pictured here on the left and on the right would cross the boundaries of race, of class, gender, physical ability and dress up as a white southern man and William would pose as her enslaved manservant essentially. Now it was a really huge risk and a testament to their bravery but in particular Ellen's bravery that they pulled this escape attempt off if they had been caught, they would have been sold, tortured, um, sorry, tortured and sold separately and never to see each other again. And you can read their narrative on the project that I've just sent, so documenting the US South. Their narrative was first published in London in 1860. It's called Running a Thousand Miles for Freedom. And I really recommend you read it because as you'd expect, it's very hair raising and I don't understand why we don't have some kind of big Hollywood film about their um, journey because as you would expect in the Jim Crow South in the 1840s, uh, white people were in a separate carriage to African Americans. So Ellen obviously posing as a white person was separated from her husband. She had to perform as this white man in this white carriage. At one stage, a white man comes into the compartment and she's terrified because she recognizes this man as a friend of her former enslaver. And obviously she's scared that he is going to recognize her in turn. But eventually they managed to make it to freedom uh, into Philadelphia and finally to Boston. But they receive word that slave catchers are on their trail and they are coming up to Boston to drag them back down into slavery in Georgia. So William sends Ellen off to stay with some friends and William um, stays in the home of Lewis Hayden, another survivor of slavery. They lie in wait for the slave catchers to approach their door. And when they do, they throw open the front door and declare very loudly to the slave catchers that the front door of the house has been lined with dynamite, with explosives, because they would rather blow themselves up and die than ever to go back into slavery. Now, this really bold and inspiring tactic works. The slave catchers back off and it gave, gives William some time to rejoin Ellen and they both decide that the US is no longer safe for them. So they travel over to Britain and they remain in England for nearly two decades and they raise five children in freedom. Both crafts travel around on the anti-slavery circuit. William gives a lot of anti-slavery lectures throughout the 1850s. Into the 1860s, he gives a lot of lectures against the Confederacy during the US Civil War as well. And he even travels to the African continent twice to try and persuade the British government to import uh, free grown cotton um, from there instead of importing slave grown cotton from the US South. Ellen challenges racist thinkers at private parties. She turns her home into a hub of black activism. She invites black lecturers to stay, for example. And when she hears in 1852 that her former enslaver accuses her of being bored in freedom and that she wants to go back into slavery, she writes a public letter 
that was published on both sides of the Atlantic, where she said, I would rather starve a free woman than be a slave for the best man that ever breathed upon the American continent. And a really lovely end to this story is that William and Ellen Craft's direct descendants, um, or some of them at least, still meet up, obviously in, in non-COVID times. And through doing the tours, I've had the pleasure of corresponding with a lot of the descendants who still very much bear the torch of freedom and social justice today, who were active in the civil rights movement of the 1960s and are still active in that movement today. But just while I talk about Ellen Craft, I just wanna reflect on black women in the anti-slavery movement, because as you'll notice, a lot of the people I discuss on the tour are men. And that's largely because of Victorian gender and racial dynamics. It was far more difficult for black women to speak on a public stage. Women were expected to be in the domestic sphere, to be looking after the home and children, etc. But black women were integral to the movement. So someone's already asked a great question about Sarah Parker Remond. Here she is on the left-hand side. Remond led a very successful anti-slavery lecturing tour in the late 1850s and early 1860s. She studied nursing in London and she actually lived out the rest of her days practicing nursing in Italy. She refused to ever go back to the US. We also have Ida B. Wells Barnett on the right-hand side. She actually spoke at Exeter Hall in 1893 and I'm going to be talking about her in the last stop on the tour. In the middle here, we have Jane Brown pictured with her children alongside her activist husband, Benjamin William Brown. They lectured in the 1880s and also sang anti-slavery songs traveling around England and Scotland. I don't know at this point whether Jane Brown gave lectures in her own right. And this speaks to a real problem we have with the archive and sort of uncovering the lives and testimonies and stories of black women in the 19th century and also in the anti-slavery movement as a whole. Because the archive, um, the 19th century archive, the 19th century archive of anti-slavery tends to invisibilize the contributions of black women. And just to give you a really obvious example of this, we know quite a lot about an activist and survivor of slavery called John Andrew Jackson. He published a slave narrative in London. He traveled over to London in the late 1850s and led a very successful anti-slavery lecturing tour all the way to the mid 1860s. And I've transcribed a lot of his speeches that he gives in Britain. And it took me a long time to figure out the fact that he was actually accompanied by his wife, Julia Jackson, who had also been enslaved. And it also took me a long time to figure out that she was giving lectures in her own right. And one of the reasons why it took me so long to figure out is because white male newspaper correspondents were completely erasing her contributions to the meeting. So you would get a large cover coverage of John Andrew Jackson's speech, and sometimes you would get nothing at all, even though I you know, later discovered that Julia Jackson would have been there. Um, she was sometimes actually mentioned in the advert for uh, an upcoming lecture, but then again, nothing was mentioned in the coverage. But I found in some uh, coverage of these lectures that uh, a white male newspaper correspondent would write something like, Mrs. Jackson also made a short speech at the meeting narrating the manner in which she made her escape. And that's literally it. I have no idea how she made her escape at this point because I'm still trying to uncover her words and testimonies from the archive. So that really gives you an idea of um, how difficult it is sometimes to work against the archive, if you like. And it's the same goes for Mary Eliza Watkins as well, who was the activist wife of James Watkins. Um, I don't know whether she gave lectures in her own right as she traveled around with her husband on the anti-slavery lecturing um, platform here in England but again I guess watch this space. Okay so thank you so much for um, the questions so far. Um, I will just have a quick um, look at some of the questions. I know we're obviously pushing um, for time. Um, did Douglas and Roper work together? Uh, no they didn't. Um, Roper actually comes back to the UK in 1846 after settling in Canada with his young family. Roper and Douglas are traveling in Scotland at the same time, um, but it doesn't look like they met or they actually um, worked um, together at all. They did not share a platform as far as I know. Um, yes, I do conduct other tours, sometimes in Edinburgh, but again, mostly in London. Um, 
did formerly uh, British and slave persons lecture in Britain? Yes, they did. Mary Prince, Alad Equiano, they were part of the first wave of abolition um, and they were really, really important in, in driving the abolition of the, the slave trade. Um, and there's another question here as well about um, where William and Ellen Craft stayed in London. So uh, they stayed in Hammersmith in London and I've been fortunate enough to work with uh, English Heritage and we're actually putting a plaque on the home that they stayed in in Hammersmith. Um, there is a plaque in the town of Hammersmith um, but not actually on the site where they stayed and I actually got an email just literally two days ago about this and they're going to unveil the plaque in September or October this year. Unfortunately there's not going to be able to have a sort of group celebration because of Covid which is a real shame um, but uh, obviously you know there's one small step in the right direction, I guess. Um, and yes, and um, there's also a great comment. Um, there's a really brilliant book by Michelle Duster, and I'm really pleased, Paula, that you just mentioned this because um, Michelle Duster is the great granddaughter of Ida B. Wells Barnett, who really keeps the legacy of Ida B. Wells alive. And uh, she's got a great book out, which is in my Amazon basket, which I need to buy. So uh, if anyone's interested in learning the, the life and legacy of Ida B. Wells, then I can't recommend um, another book, but obviously apart from Michelle Duster, who is obviously um, related to Ida B. Wells. Um, okay, so as we move on to the next stop, I know there's some really great questions, but I'm conscious of time and already I think we might be going over the hour and a half. So thank you very much for, for those of you who can stay a little bit longer, if that's okay. Um, so what we would do if we were in person and I've left this old map up here in particular, just to show you the, the distance. So it was only literally about a five minute walk, but we would be coming from Exeter Hall and we would walk all the way down to Somerset House, which stands on the site of a former Tudor Palace, which was demolished in around about 1775. This is what Somerset House looks like today. It was finished in about 1801, and it was the site of several reform meetings um, and sort of administrative offices. And, and places like that. And I'll just show you a contemporary, sorry, um, an image of what Somerset House would have looked like in the 1860s. This is it here on the left-hand side. And this is where Martin Delaney spoke in 1860 uh, in July. Now Delaney was an African nationalist. He served as a major in the US Civil War, making him the highest ranking black officer at that point in US history. He was a radical abolitionist, journalist, editor, orator, speaker, <laughs> uh, author, just literally, again, um, obviously a very accomplished man. And one of the things that he did on both sides of the Atlantic was denounce scientific racism, which was a theory developed by white racists, again, on both sides of the Atlantic and promoted by enslavers which was a theory that people of color were naturally and biologically inferior to the white or Anglo-Saxon race. And Delaney railed against that. He pointed to the rich history and civilizations of um, African history. And he also pointed to contemporary individuals like Frederick Douglass um, as, a, as a complete way to um, revoke these horrific and racist theories. Now, Martin Delaney was here at Somerset House for the International Statistics Conference in July 1860, which sounds hideously boring, um, but I assure you it was anything but. So this conference was sponsored by aristocrats. One of its patrons was Prince Albert, so the husband of Queen Victoria. And the, uh, they also, the conference was supported by other aristocrats like former prime ministers, and also another abolitionist aristocrat called Lord Henry Browham, who gave a speech at this conference. And it's likely this was prearranged, but Lord Henry Browham was speaking. He notices Martin Delaney in the audience and he turns to his left to the men sitting on the platform alongside him, one of whom is George Dallas, the American minister to Britain. And Brown turns to him and says, Mr. Dallas, there's a Negro come to meet you. And the whole conference erupts in a commotion and uproar. And according to the local press, this remark was public revenge after the fact that Dallas 
uh, obviously a white American had entered a private and aristocratic London club, found out that a person of color had been admitted there on terms of equality with other white members and left in disgust. Now Delaney manages to stand up and make himself heard amongst all the commotion and he says four very simple words, I am a man. And this really sort of bold and simple statement, as I'm sure you'll recognize, was sort of echoed down into the civil rights movement of the 1960s. And even just a few months ago, I saw on social media, Anthony Mackey of Avengers fame, he was wearing a t-shirt on Instagram bearing those very same words, I am a man. So it's really interesting to think about the larger and the wider history um, of that phrase. Now, I mentioned that Delaney was an officer during the Civil War, and I just want to dwell on the Civil War very briefly, because the war had huge consequences for the British Isles. Now, as you'll know, the war was um, fought over slavery. The Confederacy was synonymous with slavery and white supremacy. And Britain became really close to recognizing, to formally recognizing the Confederacy, mainly for two reasons. A lot of politicians in Britain actually admired the South's calls for a new independent republic, but it was also because Britain relied so much on the importation of cotton and rice and sugar, as I've already mentioned. And just to give you that fact again, by the mid 1850s, 90% of the cotton that was being imported into Liverpool was slave grown. So there were real concerns that there would be a blockade cotton would not be able to come to Britain and there would be thousands of white working classes uh, unable to work in the factories because of that lack of cotton. And that's exactly what happened. So in 1862, there was a blockade which led to the unemployment, the mass unemployment of tens of thousands of white working classes in Lancashire, um, Nottinghamshire, Derbyshire, Cheshire, and they suffered unemployment, famine, poverty, because uh, of the result of the war. And African-Americans, including William Andrew Jackson, actually toured these areas and lectured to these white working classes and said, you know, I know you're suffering. I know this is really difficult for you, but you cannot support the Confederacy. I am a survivor of US slavery, and I know the Confederacy is synonymous with slavery. And he tried to convince those audiences and was quite successful in a lot of different areas about um, how they should um, sort of identify with the enslaved and should not um, support um, uh, oppressors. And just before I finish this particular uh, stop, I just want to read you a, uh, an appeal that Frederick Douglass sends over to Britain, which was published in several British newspapers. He called it the Slaves Appeal to Great Britain, where he essentially tries to convince British audiences not to support the Confederacy. He says, Oh, I pray you by all your highest and holiest memories, blast not the budding hopes of these millions of enslaved by lending your countenance and extending your honored and potent hand to the bloodstained fingers of the impious slaveholding Confederate States of America. Welcome not those brazen human fleshmongers those brokers in the bodies and souls of men who have dared to knock at your doors for admission into the family of nations. Their pretended government is but a foul, haggard and blighting conspiracy against the sacred rights of mankind and does not deserve the name of government. Its foundation is laid in the impudent and heaven insulting dogma that man may rightfully hold property in man and flog him to toil like a beast of burden. Have no fellowship, I pray you, with these merciless men stealers, but rather with whips of scorpions, scourge them beyond the beneficent range of national brotherhood. So really blistering testimony from Douglas there. And much to the relief of Douglas and other African-Americans who were traveling and lecturing against slavery and against the Confederacy during the US Civil War, Britain didn't actually formally recognize the Confederacy. And I think a lot of their lectures went a long way in informing the public, at least at the grassroots level, um, for the real reasons um, of the war. Um, okay, so just having a look at some of the questions here. Um, thanks, Robert, for posting my contact details. 
Um, I'm happy to send um, folks, there's a question about sending a bibliography. I'm more than happy to do that. Um, so there's a couple of questions about travel. So um, sometimes abolitionists would pay for the tickets on a steamship. They would travel usually from Boston or New York to Liverpool. Sometimes they would travel from Nova Scotia. Um, depending on whether US soil was safe for them, sometimes they would go to Nova Scotia and sail to England uh, from there. Um, Frederick Douglass experiences um, racism on both journeys from the US to the UK and back again in that he purchases a first class ticket um, and he's actually, um, relig um, he's actually sent to steerage um, because um, the, the, ca the captain and the, um, the people who basically sell the ticket, the Cunard company, um, don't want him mixing with white passengers. Um, the other interesting thing about travel is that when Sarah Parker Raymond travels around England in the late 1850s, she applies for a passport to visit France um, from the US embassy and the embassy actually deny her request because two years before in 1857, there was the infamous Dred Scott decision, which said that um, black people were essentially not citizens of the US. And the US embassy actually argued that because Raymond was a black American, um, she was not a citizen of the US, so that she could not actually get a passport to go to France. The same thing happened in Frederick Douglass when he applied for a passport um, in the same year in 1859. Um, Someone's mentioned a comment about uh, writing. Um, did the writers have assistance from ghost writers? Um, Frederick Douglass never had assistance from white writers. <laughs> um, and a lot of African-Americans didn't either. Sometimes African-American narratives um, were uh, written by an amanuensis, um, which is essentially by a white author. Um, but if that was the case, they usually asserted their independence and literary work or um, oratorical um, power in other ways. So thank you for those questions. Um, okay, so on to the penultimate stop then. So if we were in person, we would come out of Somerset House and just walk down the road a couple of minutes and we would get to Arundel Street, which is not a very exciting looking street. Um, it's a sort of office and apartment blocks there now, but it stands on the site of the Crown and Anchor Tavern where Frederick Douglass spoke here in May and in August 1846. And I'm coming back to Frederick Douglass because I want to illustrate one of the main themes of his oratory here in Britain and Ireland, here at the Crown and Anchor Tavern, but in pretty much every speech Douglass gave on British soil. And that concerned religious hypocrisy. So Douglass attacked enslavers who said they were Christian as he believed that the very brutalizing nature of slavery was completely incompatible with Christianity what he called the woman whipping religion of the South. And Douglas was a very religious man, but he would argue how could a Christian preach to a congregation, for example, return to uh, their congregation, sorry, return to their plantation and whip or rape enslaved women and children. Um, those two things were completely incompatible. And in doing so, he was really tapping into debates that were going around British society at that point whether British churches should revoke fellowship with slaveholding churches or churches that were silent or, or even sanctioned slavery. And Douglas was really getting to the heart of that in, and also to the heart of some of the protests that are going on right now, which argue that silence is a form of complicity. It's a type of violence itself. So he was really trying to make British and Irish audiences aware of the, those brutalities of slavery and the dangers of not speaking out against slavery in all of its forms. And just to read you an excerpt of one of his speeches, whips, chains, gags, bloodhounds, thumbscrews, and all the bloody paraphernalia of slavery lie right under the drippings of the sanctuary. And instead of being corroded and rusted by its influence, they are kept in a state of preservation. Ministers of religion defend slavery from the Bible. Ministers of religion own any number of slaves. Bishops trade in human flesh. Churches may be said to be literally built up in human skulls and their very walls cemented with human blood. Women are sold at the public block to support a minister, to support a church. Human beings sold to buy sacramental services 
and all of course with the sanction of the religion of the land. So again, really, really blistering testimony from Douglas there. And he uses this testimony and his experience as a survivor of slavery to expose the actions of the Free Church of Scotland. Now the Free Church was formed in 1844, uh, sorry, 1843, led by Thomas Chalmers and his supporters. And there were several Free Church ministers that were sent to the US to raise money for this new church, this new organization to ensure its survival. They returned to Scotland with about 10,000 pounds, 3,000 pounds of which come directly from enslavers in the Southern states. Now, as we know, a lot of enslavers in the South were Scottish or had Scottish ancestry. So obviously there provides the link, but abolitionists on both sides of the Atlantic are incensed to find out about this money. Frederick Douglass travels around Scotland in 1846 and he subsequently talks about the Free Church when he arrives back in London and speaks about it at the Crown and Anchor Tavern in August 1846. But he talks about how could a church calling itself the Free Church actually take money from enslavers. And he settles on this campaign slogan, if you like, send back the blood stain money. And he speaks to hundreds of thousands of people across Scotland. So Edinburgh, Glasgow, Aberdeen, Dundee, Songs and poems were written about the Free Church campaign and about Douglas. Send Back the Money was painted in red paint on Free Church buildings. It was even carved into the hillside of Arthur's Seat, so a small little mountain in Edinburgh, um, and uh, which was apparently that, that writing could be viewed from a couple of miles away, according to Douglas. Now, no other white abolitionist could describe the realities of slavery like Douglas. He accused free church ministers of accepting that bloodstained money, which obviously ought to have gone into his education. And he even created a fictional scenario for his audiences where he imagined himself as being sold by his enslaver with the profits going to the free church treasury. Now, unfortunately, the money was actually never returned. But as Douglas later said in his second autobiography, my Bondage and My Freedom, which was published in 1855, he actually said that um, it gave them an opportunity or gave him an opportunity to make British and Scottish people aware of the links between US slavery um, and, and obviously Britain. I realise it's now half four, so if you are okay to all stay with me, I would just head to the last stop. I know I've been talking for a an hour and a half. Um, I uh, know we started a couple of minutes late, but if it's all right with you, I'll go straight into the next stop. And for those of you who can hang around for a little bit longer, I'll do my best to answer as many questions as possible. Oh yeah, Hannah, feel free to keep going on. We'll have, we have a hard stop though in like um, maybe 12 or 15 minutes because we have another program coming up. But yeah, continue on as long as you want. <laughs> Don't tempt me. Okay, thanks Robert. Okay, so um, what we would normally do then is that we would turn back on ourselves and head towards in this direction, which is Hoban Town Hall. So this is what the town hall looks like. And this was the site of Ida B. Wells Barnett's speech about temperance, actually. So 50 years before, just around the corner, Frederick Douglass speaks about temperance and Ida B. Wells speaks about temperance here as well in May, 1894. I'll refer to her as Ida B. Wells because at this point she's actually um, traveling around Britain unmarried um, as a single African-American woman. Um, but she travels to Britain twice in 1893 and in 1894. Now, Wells was a, a very inspiring activist. She continues to inspire a lot of social justice campaigners today. She was one of the co-founders of the NAACP, which is one of America's oldest civil rights organizations. And historians estimate that roughly between the 1880s and the 1960s, 4,400 African-American women, men and children were lynched, so murdered without trial at the hands of white mobs, although the real number is likely to be a lot higher than that. And these lynchings were public acts of torture where women, men and children were burned, hanged, stabbed, shot, mutilated, and photographs of their bodies were taken and sometimes white children were given the day off school to watch. Now, Wells's campaign against lynching actually began after a friend of hers was lynched in Memphis and she was outraged. She wrote an editorial in her 
a newspaper denouncing the white supremacist mob. She was actually chased out of Memphis on pain of death, but she vowed to record as much information as possible about lynching. And on the right hand side, you have one of her pamphlets here, Southern Horrors, Lynch Law and All of Its Phases. Now, controversially for the time, Wells actually attacks the justification for lynching. So she talks about white supremacy, but she also talks about um, the sort of black male criminality and the rape of innocent white women by sexually aggressive black men. She argued that there were very, very, very few cases of that happening. It was really non-existent. Um, and it was just used as an excuse by white mobs and white communities. She also records a large number of white women actually voluntarily entering into relationships with um, black men. And then when they were found out by their white communities, um, they cried rape, which led to the death of their former lovers. Now, Wells visits Britain again, as I mentioned, in 1893 and 1894. Her 1894 trip is really successful. So she raises a lot of support for her cause. She works with newspaper editors, students from the University College London, religious ministers, reformers. Um, she holds several meetings against lynching in London. She cuts out a lot of the coverage of her meetings from newspapers, collects them all together, and then sends them to governors of US Southern states um, and even the president to illustrate the fact that she was in the UK and exposing their crimes abroad. You can imagine the responses from these white Southern governors and Wells would often quote their racist responses in her meetings in Britain and say, out of their own mouths will the murderers be condemned. Now very quickly, just before I finish, I just wanna tell a story in relation to her first tour in 1893, because it links to Moses Roper in the sense that sometimes white networks or white reformers could actually jeopardize a black activist mission. And Wells was invited over to Britain in the first place by a radical white Quaker woman called Catherine Impey. And they worked very closely together. But very long story short, Impey and Wells are in Aberdeen. They're working with another white reformer called Isabel Fivey Mayo. And Impey writes a letter to one of Mayo's boarders who's staying at her house, who happens to be an East Indian gentleman. She proposes marriage. The gentleman says no, but shows the letter to Mayo, who is incensed at what she describes as MP's impropriety. And once MP completely removed from the movement, wants her declared mentally insane. And she turns to Wells and says, you know, can you denounce her as well? This puts Wells in a really difficult position because the two had worked really closely together and in a gesture of friendship and solidarity uh, and, and trust, Wells refuses to denounce MP and Mayo completely cuts her off as a result. And the damage of that is that uh, Mayo has a lot of connections in London. So usually during the month of May, there'd be a lot of annual reform meetings taking place. So anyone who was anyone was in London, essentially hopping from one meeting to another. And by cutting Wells off from being introduced to a lot of those networks, she couldn't maximize support for her cause. She couldn't go and meet person X who then would introduce her to person Y. Those networks were hugely important. So she actually leaves Britain slightly earlier than planned. When she comes back the following year, she works with Mayo again, but as soon as she steps foot on UK soil, Mayo wants her to denounce Catherine Impey once again. She refuses once again, and Mayo cuts her off for a short time, but she's able to forge her own connections this time, working with uh, ministers in Liverpool where she's first based and then she manages to get to London. Now, just as I finish up, I just wanna read you an excerpt from one of her speeches where she says, lynching happened not during the days of the Spanish Inquisition, not during the dark ages of the world, but they were committed in the glare of the 19th century civilization and by men who belonged to the Anglo-Saxon race who boasted of their Christianity. The world, I believe, has done so little regarding this matter because it knows so little. It's my mission to give to the world the black people's side of the story. So I like to end my tours on that phrase because it's a perfect summary of all the reasons why African-Americans were traveling over to Britain and Ireland to share that testimony, to stand up on platforms for hours on end, often pushing their bodies and voices to, to quite literally to breaking point. And some of the sites that I've shown you today might now be hotels or apartment blocks or anything like that. 
but they're really inspiring sites for the history of, of black activism and black American activism. And I think particularly right now, we should all share in their hope that one day we will live in a far more equal and just world. So thank you so much for listening to me for so long. I know I've gone on uh, a little bit longer than planned. Um, if I will stay, Robert, for uh, if that's okay with you for a couple of minutes, answer a few oh, questions. Yeah. Yes, please do so. Yeah, and then you just tell me when we need to leave. <laughs> okay, no problem. Um, yeah, we can stay for a little bit. Usually we don't have programs um, back to back, but uh, today, we, today we do. That's not a problem. Other, um, otherwise you can keep talking till midnight. <laughs> yeah, again, don't tempt me off. I think I could. Um, so, um again thank you for all your um all your comments so um i think like paul has put some really great recommendations in the q a in terms of um books if you could also put them in the chat box i think that would be really helpful um in terms of resources um i just put my website in there again because a few people are asking for it um, this is my website which maps the african-american journeys Documenting the US South was the website with all of the slave narratives that you can read for free, including Running a Thousand Miles for Freedom. That's the narrative written by William and Ellen Craft. Um, and you can read more about um, lynching and Ida B. Wells with the Equal Justice Initiative. And then also the book that Paul has already mentioned. So Michelle Duster's new book. Um, I don't have the title right now, but um, it's literally just published and she's the descendant of Ida B. Wells. Um, so again, please feel free if you want to um, uh, get in touch and ask sort of more direct questions or anything like that. I think Robert's provided my email. Um, yeah. And I'll, I'll email that to everyone as well. Oh, fantastic. In addition Thank to information you. on your book when it comes out. Yes. So I, the Frederick Douglass and Britain, Frederick Douglass in Britain and Ireland book should be April or May. But again, COVID dependent, that might change. So I've been saying um, spring. Um, there's a question here about um, terms and language. So uh, what's the difference between abolitionists and radical abolitionists? So one of the distinctions that I would actually make is at the time being an abolitionist was some, you know, for some a dirty word, um, and particularly if you're a radical abolitionist, because that usually meant that you wanted an immediate end to slavery. And that was seen as quite a radical position. There were certain abolitionists on both sides of the Atlantic that advocated for a more gradual abolition so that there would be a date set in five or 10 years time and that you would essentially, excuse me, work towards that date. So the logic behind that was so that, you know, the country would have time to prepare or something like that. But obviously for a lot of survivors of slavery and for those radical abolitionists like William Lloyd Garrison, for example, they wanted slavery to end at that very second because they knew that millions of people were suffering and dying um, at that very moment. So um, I think that's one of the main dis differences that um, I would draw. Um, someone's asking about Josiah Henson and meeting Queen Victoria. Yes, I think you might have come in a little bit late. Um, I talked a little bit about that. So uh, Henson is invited to meet Queen Victoria in March 1877 at Windsor Castle. And there's some great sharing as well from the, the chat box about some of this history. It's really lovely to sort of go back and, uh, and read. So um, thank you very much for that. And again, thank you to folks who have been um, popping some reading lists um, on, on the chat box. There are some really great books about Douglas uh, in Britain. So you have um, Alan Rice has written a really great book on Douglas in Britain, and there are some, there are lots of books about Douglas and Ireland. So the book that um, I'm working on at the moment um, attempts to re redress that balance slightly. So I talk a lot about Douglas in England, for example, um, and also his second and third trip. So Douglas travels to Britain again in 1859 um, for about six months. Um, that isn't sort of that isn't covered very well or a lot, and. Um, uh, his third trip to visit to Britain as well. And there are some brilliant books as well. Thank you, John, for pointing that out. Um, some brilliant books by Professor Celeste Marie Bernier about Frederick Douglass. She's the, one of the world's leading, or if not the leading expert on Frederick Douglass in the world. Um, and also Alistair Pettinger. Um, he's done a lot of work in Scotland, but I can provide a reading list um, for that. So I think I'll end there, because again, I'm conscious that you've got to get ready for your next tour, but thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And thank you to Robert.
thank you. <laughs> Great. So thanks so much, Hannah. So again, I'll email some of the information that we talked about out to everyone that signed up and we'll circle back with you soon. So everyone have a great weekend. And thanks, Hannah. Thank you thanks, so much. Thanks everyone. Take care. Take care. Thanks, Robert. No, thank you.